Happy Sabbath to each of you. It's nice to see you here tonight, and uh, I'd like to begin this evening by sharing with you a, a little Bible text here, a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege we have of being together a little while this evening as we usher in the Sabbath hours. May we feel and sense the blessing of your Holy Spirit in our midst tonight. May you be our teacher and our guide. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a, a little account here in Luke, the 22nd chapter, where Jesus is talking to his disciples about the difference between the kingdoms of this age and the kingdom of heaven and the relationship that disciples and teachers and pastors and masters and so forth should have with one another. He's speaking to Peter. Actually, he's speaking to the disciples in verse 29. He says, And I appoint to you a kingdom as my Father has appointed to me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. It's an interesting passage, isn't it? His disciples have been with him quite some time. And Jesus is quite forthright here with Peter. When you're converted, he says. And Peter's already been out on missionary trips. He's already been working to build up the gospel, build up the kingdom. But there's something else in that text that I really like, and that's where he says, I have a kingdom to give to you. We probably don't stop and think about the significance of that as we often should, as often as we should. Tonight we're going to be looking at the final conflict, actually tonight and tomorrow. These, these two presentations are bound together. They're also based upon what we covered last weekend in those four presentations that laid the foundation for understanding how doctrine is actually changed through the new version culture. Um, without a careful reading of the text, um, you can just slip into error and not even know it. Now, there's a, there is a presentation that we don't have in here. I wish we could have put it in, but it takes a little bit of time to develop for it. It's a very unique presentation. And perhaps it's one of the most important. Because, you see, um, you can read the King James Version. You can read all of the new versions. And you can get... Whether it's, uh, obviously, with the King James, you will get more of a sense, I believe, of, of the Word of God simply because of the heritage of that line of manuscripts. But as many Bible scholars have said, read all the versions you want. In fact, we'll probably see um, a statement here to that effect in a little while, if not tonight, at least tomorrow. You can get a sense of the kingdom of God. You can get a sense of what God wants of his people by reading any Bible, um, as long as it is a, a Christian-focused book. But there is something that's happening in the end of the age. The devil knows what's afoot. God has a very clear plan what he's doing with his church. However, the church doesn't quite have that clear yet, or as clear as it ought to have it. Uh, there are many things that we can come to terms with on the clarity of how God wants to move through these final days of earth's history 
and have the church as that centerpiece, that jewel that portrays the very character of Jesus. And that's something that the church doesn't understand very well. And that's the piece that's missing here. And the reason I put it that way is because the critics are very fond of saying, well, can't you, can't you read any Bible and get the gospel? Well, sure you can. But we're not looking for just the gospel. God has a plan. That plan is deep. That plan is profound. That plan will have uh, an incredible impact on the world, I think far more than we realize. Revelation 18 tells us that. But there's something about bringing the church through these final days that the church at large, and I'm talking about the church universal. I'm not talking about just the Catholic church. I'm talking about the universal church worldwide. That church does not have a clear picture on some of the fine points of what God intends to accomplish through his people. And that's what the Advent movement is all about. The devil knows that. And because he knows God has a very clear outline for that, a very clear purpose for that, uh, just as his hatred against the Word has been so intense from the very beginning when Jesus showed up on the scene as a babe in the manger, just as Satan has a great desire to stamp the word out, and since he's not been able to do that, so he has also a great desire to do whatever he can to keep us from seeing God's plan clearly. And this presentation tonight and the one following tomorrow gives you some basis on which to think and to understand what, the, uh, what goes into determining faithfulness and loyalty in the end of the age as Jesus comes. And it's a profound picture but the critics have been hard on it. They've made fun of it. And it's had its effect on the Advent movement. The way the, the, way the critics have moved against this message, and you can read about it in some literature that comes off the press right today. In fact, I just got another one of those pieces of literature in my mailbox today. And... Uh, it makes such light of this message, but I'm telling you this evening that God has a purpose in his plan and we do well to consider um, how he's laid it out for us and, and how he will prove and test his people through to the end. Now the weakest, and I have to say this, the weakest of the weak You've heard this before, but it's important to say it right here because we're looking at a serious thing, you know, the final conflict. That's, that's a pretty heady thing to talk about, as if we know something, you know, about the end. But if we believe the Bible, the Bible tells us there is a final conflict, doesn't it? So we can talk about it. And we can talk about it as if we know something because the Bible has given us that information. But in this, as we look at this, I think you will see that um, Satan will do everything he can to turn your mind on it and to keep you from getting it. Let's present it and let's see how it goes when you get to the end of it tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and let's see how the impress of the message comes through. I have to depend upon the Holy Spirit, as I should, that what we try to present so that we can present a clear picture of the, uh, of the enemy's purpose and God's design for us to be victorious, I have to present that the best I can, but I can't make it 
what it ought to be to you. The Holy Spirit has to do that. And, and I trust that the Holy Spirit will take these feeble efforts to make that so in your life. So let's start, and um, if you'll be patient with the process, because there's, there, there's a lot of information to cover, and I'd like to cover maybe two-thirds of it this evening so that it's a little bit shorter tomorrow morning. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33, here we have a, a place in Scripture where God pointed to His law and He showed Israel the attributes of His own character that He wanted to write upon their hearts. And He said in these words, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This is God's design that His law is written in the heart. So to the very end, the law is very important. And it is God's purpose that it be in the mind, it be in the heart. It be, it be so much a part of us that uh, we just reflect it. That's His purpose. We have these things in the Scripture that remind us of the qualities of God's law. Um, the fact that it's just and true and pure and good and spiritual and holy and righteous and perfect. All of those passages there underscore that. And by the way, you have this, most of this material in your, in your textbook. But we also have the rejection of God's character. And we see that referenced here in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. And just look at that catalog of the things that are involved in the rejection of God's, God's character, taking it into our lives. The rejection of it is lovers of self, covetous, boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, no natural affection. We're seeing that in our society, aren't we? No natural affection. Some people are without that. They're, something's happening in their, in their upbringing, in their context, in the culture. Something's happening there that uh, people are developing without conscience, it seems. Truce breakers, false, abuser, uh, false accusers, incontinent, just, you know, doing, running off, fierce despisers of those good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Isn't that the truth today? I mean, if we're not careful, that even affects us. It all started with Satan's rebellion in heaven. Isaiah 14, you're familiar with this passage about his fall from heaven, how he, he wanted to be like the Most High, not really, he didn't really want to be like God. He wanted God's power, that's what he wanted. He wanted God's power and control, um, his authority, uh, but not in the way that God uh, demonstrates it in the universe. And so there was war in heaven, Revelation 12 tells us he was cast out to the earth and, and a great host of angels. I have no idea uh, the number, but it's um, a great many. And, and the, think of those evil angels all throughout the world. And we as human beings, we come and go in our generations, don't we? We come up, we live for a few short years and we die. But these angels, think about that. They've been around. They've been able to have one generation and work on them, then another generation, another generation, thousands of generations. You have something to consider in terms of the um, enemy of darkness. We don't make light of that. That's, and we're coming up on a season of the year here where... Um, it, it is a diabolical thing in society. And uh, with this end of October and so on, it's no laughing matter. It's no little cute thing, you know, that we dress the kids up for. We should know better. Um, these things are serious, and the devil loves it when we don't take it seriously uh, because he knows we're not thinking about it. The Bible tells us the devil's come down to you. Now, this is the Bible's words. These are God's words. The devil has come down, where? To us. He has great wrath. I can't think of anything more scary, more 
uh, distressing than to have someone like the devil who's been around for centuries, for millennia, and all of his angels with him, and um, they know their days are numbered. They've read the same Bible that you and I are reading. They know how the story ends, but there's something in those personalities, in those characters that drive them. And the only thing that drives them is pure, unadulterated evil to destroy. Uh, we are so blessed that as a general rule in our world, moving about the way we do, we don't hardly know there's that reality. The, the fact that we, the fact that you and me, most of us, we don't dabble in the occult. We don't dabble in the powers of darkness. Therefore, And because we have faith, because we trust God, because we believe in God and we're looking for His kingdom, the devil doesn't bother us like he bothers some people in this world. Some people who are very superstitious. Some people that have been trained, been raised up to have these, these worries and doubts and concerns and be... Uh, worked upon by the powers of darkness. Most of us in the household of faith don't have that. And so we may tend to think at times, or tend not to think, that there's anything to be concerned about. Not so, according to what the Bible says. The Bible tells us very clearly there's a problem here, and it's a deep, serious one. And the Satan is wroth. That is, he, he's, he's beyond angry. And so uh, that's something to consider. It's not uh, because we have Jesus who is far superior in power and strength. And there's no comparison. When you put the devil side by side with Christ in power and authority, the devil doesn't have anything at all. He, he has absolutely nothing. And that's why I said at the very beginning, the weakest of the weak in terms of God's people, um, Satan is no match for them. Isn't that an interesting thing? It's a wonderful thing. The person that considers their faith, their understanding of spiritual things, they might say, and I've heard this from people, you know, I just don't understand. I don't understand. I read the Bible and I don't understand these things. But they have faith. They know Jesus loves them. They know that he died on the cross for them. They have confidence in that. They might not know much, but the devil's no match for them because they have Jesus as their advocate. And that's the important thing. But I, want us to, I just want us to be aware of that reality there on the one hand and yet on the other hand. Nothing to be afraid of, nothing to worry about so long as Christ Jesus is our focus. The war that Satan waged against the law of God in heaven, he now wages against those who keep God's commandments on earth. This last stand warfare on Satan's part is not going to be some little thing done in a corner somewhere. No, no, this is going to be big. It's going to be worldwide, and it's going to involve every living soul. Actually, it's not going to. It is. It is right now. We have biblical evidence of a global scale of this conflict. In Revelation 13, verse 8, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book, of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So if you're not worshiping Jesus, if Christ is not your Savior, and if that's not where your focus day by day is, then you're going to worship this other one. It's just the way it's going to be. It's going to be one or the other. And praise the Lord. And I've, I've said this to myself many times. I've thought, how lucky... No, no, no. Providence smiled upon me that I should have known the gospel 
almost 60 years ago. That somebody gave it to me. That somebody nurtured me in that. Uh, I just, I cannot express what I think about that in terms of thankfulness. It's one of those questions you say, it's not why me in the negative sense, God, but why me with such blessing? And that's the way I feel about it. And if there's anything I can do to encourage somebody to believe in God, I will do it. The war, the conflict, it's going to be global in in scope. And the focus is not on the world out there. A lot of bad things are happening in the world. I mean, the devil has enough um, agents to put them to work doing all kinds of mischief, and he does. We can see that in terms of war among the nations. And the strange and distressing philosophies that exist that always try to keep God pushed out of the picture. So, yes, Satan has a lot to do with that, I'm sure. And uh, so does the basic, uh, the basic carnal nature of man. But the real focus of the conflict is on the church of God. And specifically on those who are beginning to see the issues form up which the enemy doesn't want us to see or understand. Those are really the targets. And and that's where the lion's share of the energy is going to go. So now think of this. You look around yourself, look around the world at all that's taking place that is not righteous. And how much is there? Well, it's global, isn't it? And there's plenty. But if that's not the lion's share, if that's not where the focus is, then what can you expect in the church? Should it surprise us that the church seems sleepy? Not at all. Not when we consider the biblical picture of what Satan's wrath is against the church, against, the, against especially the remnant as it describes it there in Revelation. All of the things that go wrong in the church shouldn't surprise us at all because that's just evidence that the lion's share of his wrath and his anger is, is focused on being sure that the church is not able to represent God in the world. And that's his purpose. And, and he has an agenda because he knows that his time is short. And if possible, he, and I suppose this is the perversity of sin, he must, even though he knows his time is short, he must have some kind of concept, but maybe I could still win. You know, isn't that insane? And yet that's what sin is. Sin is insanity. So here's what you can expect. No justice. We're seeing a lot of that in our world. You go to court. I know a fellow right now, I've been corresponding with him for a number of years. And uh, he's in prison. He's doing God's work there. It's my estimation with, and I can't say that I know everything about it, but uh, I don't think he should be there wrong place at the wrong time, no justice. It happens. And we found out here not too long ago that there have been a lot of people on death row. Some executed and shouldn't have been, you know, according to the law. Because they weren't guilty. Now they're rethinking that whole thing and I mean, they know that by what they, what they didn't see because of the progress in DNA analysis. And now they're finding that a lot of people on death row, they're finding that their cases are being thrown out because of the evidence now doesn't stand up. 
Oh, it's scary, isn't it? No justice. That's just in the world of court. But when it comes to the church, you can expect no mercy. We're talking about the final moments. We're not talking about everything right now necessarily. There's still, God's Spirit is still restraining in the land, isn't he? We still have the influence of the Holy Spirit. We can, somebody has said, even the unbeliever has no idea how much they owe to the people of God in the earth as a salt of the earth. Because the Spirit of God is still restraining in the, in the world today. And we can be thankful for that. We can praise God for that every day. There will come a time, according to Revelation 13, don't have the text here, but it's in Revelation 13, where there's a total economic boycott. Well, there's a lot being said about the economy today, the global economy. You can be sure that before it's over, there's going to be um, some wonderful things to see and behold in regard to economic things. But it's going to be eventually a trial for God's people because according to that text in Revelation 13, there will come a day when you can't buy or sell. When you can't buy or sell, you are really put in a very difficult place. When you can't buy your groceries, you can't sell anything. Confiscation of your property. One place it says in the spirit of prophecy that every form of earthly support is going to be cut out from underneath us. Well, right now we still have forms of support, don't we? I'm thankful for those forms of support. There will come a time when that is not there. Former friends in the truth, this is a tough one. Former friends in the truth will become the most bitter enemies. They become the most bitter enemies, number one, because they lose the Spirit of God in their lives. They become careless. Whatever reasons, they, their experience with God grows dim and then dies. And then as a result of that, because they know inside how the Advent movement is, how the remnant functions, obviously they're the best positioned to work most effectively against uh, the truth of God as it's trying to be represented to the world. So we are now in the as the storm approaches time. There is a reference that speaks of as the storm approaches. We're in that period of time, as the storm approaches. It's like I was driving out here this evening. It's been a beautiful day today, hasn't it? And I looked off in here to the west and thought, man, that looks like snow clouds. That looks like rain clouds or something there. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't look like what I want to see right now. Um, there is this in the spiritual world. There's a storm approaching and there's a number of, exp there are a number of expressions about this storm that's coming. Uh, I think Ted referenced it last weekend. The storm relentless in its fury. Relentless. You know, normally you think of a storm that kind of lets up and get a breather. This one is relentless. There is need of a Sabbath reform, the Lord tells us. Um, need for Sabbath reform among us who profess to observe God's holy rest day. Some discuss their business matters and lay plans on the Sabbath. And God looks upon this in the same light as though they engaged in the actual transactions of business. Others who are well acquainted with the Bible, with the Bible evidences that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, enter into the partnerships with men who have no respect for God's holy day. A Sabbath keeper cannot allow men in his employ, paid by his money, to work on the Sabbath. If for the sake of gain he allows the business in which he has an interest to be carried on on the Sabbath by his unbelieving partner, he is equally guilty with the unbeliever. And it is his duty to dissolve the relation, however much he may lose by so doing. Men may think they cannot afford to obey God, but they cannot afford to disobey him. Those who are careless in their observance of the Sabbath will suffer great loss. 
years ago, as um, Linda was developing her business, we went into partnership with a, um, a workmate of hers. And we should have known better. Uh, we had the counsel. We do stupid things, don't we? We had the counsel, we knew. But you make these conjectures and you make these um, insinuations that this will work because of this or that or the other thing. That relationship was no sooner formed <laughs> than we realized it was a mistake. And now it was done. You know, you have, you know, you've got your legal status, you've got your papers all signed, you have your understanding of partnership, and now you realize, oh dear. How did we do that? How did we step outside of the bounds of the spirit of prophecy that would have guided us and kept us from having to deal with the aftermath of that poor decision. It cost. It did cost to set that right. But we weren't in it very long before we realized, you know, in fact, it's this council right here that set the course on what needed to be done. So it's never too late to turn around and, and say, all right, Lord, and even if you didn't know that it was there, but in our case, we knew it was in the back of our minds, kind of. But why was it in the back of our minds, kind of? I'll tell you why, and then you can see why it is in your life that those things happen. It was in the back of our minds, kind of, because we had stopped reading the material. So it wasn't fresh, it wasn't... You know, there's something about taking one of those books. In fact, I was doing it again the other day. Opened one up and I was reading. I don't know about you, I'm the kind of person that... I can read an encyclopedia because, it looks inter because there are things that lead you from one thing to the next and just keeps you going. And you might... You, probably you're not that way, but... When I open the Spirit of Prophecy and some of these other books, I find that that's what happens. They're inspiring. They pull you. They want to give you more of God and His understanding, His principles for your life. Well, that's why we entered into a partnership that we shouldn't have entered into is because the things were not fresh in our mind. We weren't continually reading and refreshing those things. And so let that be a lesson to me. Where are you in these things? There is a startling prediction. The Lord has a controversy with His professed people, it says, in these last days. Notice, in these last days. In this controversy, men in responsible positions will take a course directly opposite to that pursued by Nehemiah. They will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but they will try to keep others keep it from others by burying it underneath the rubbish of custom and tradition. In churches and in large gatherings in the open air, ministers will urge upon the people the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. There are calamities on land, on sea and land, and these calamities will increase, one disaster following close upon another, and the little band of conscientious Sabbath keepers will be pointed out as the ones who are bringing the wrath of God upon the world by their disregard of Sunday. Now, this warning is going to be in its fulfillment a little bit further on down in, in, our, you know, in our time. But it will be. This is from the Spirit of Prophecy. There will come a time when there is this thing taking place where people will, because of the focus that is coming, that will come upon the first day of the week, there will be those who will, they'll find themselves being separated out in society and they will become marked because they're not going the way of culture. They're not um, siding with the mass of humanity. Look around the world today. What do you see when it comes to uh, the, let's say, the uh, caricature of religion? 
I just noticed it, you know, when we looked at some of the uh, TV programs. For example, one that comes quickly to mind is MASH. Is anybody familiar with that program on TV, MASH, the Army thing? Uh, who is the religionist on the show? Is it a rabbi? Is it a priest? Is it a pastor? Who is the, who is the person who represents religion in the program? Chaplain. Pardon? He's a chaplain. He's a chaplain, but what is he? It's called, called denomination. Well, you'd like to think so. He's a representative of all the denominations. He's supposed to. But he's a priest, isn't he? A priest that represents probably more Christians on the earth than any other denomination. So that's, that's, a, cultural, uh, that's a culturally embedded consciousness of this is what a religionist looks like in terms of Christianity. So... Typically, when it's uh, represented or caricatured in the literature, it'll most likely be a Catholic priest. There are calamities. Let's see, we read that. Let's go to this one here. Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. We probably don't understand completely what that means yet. But it does mean that there will be in churches pastors who will stand in the pulpit with something about prophecy that's right, right out of the hand of Satan. You will only know that by the, through the difference of uh, reading the Word and the Spirit of Prophecy. This is an interesting one here. A company was presented before me under the name of Seventh-day Adventists who were advising that the banner or sign which makes us a distinctive people should not be held out so strikingly, for they claimed it was not the best policy in securing success to our institutions. This distinctive banner is to be borne through the world to the close of probation. This is interesting in my mind. Because this prophecy has already been fulfilled. In many places, and you don't have to go very far to find this, many places, you see it used to be when we build a church and put the name up there, Seventh-day Adventist, that was the focus of the church, get the name up there. So that the church itself could be um, a witness in the community while it just sits there on the property. And the sign identifies this is a place where people, who are Seventh-day Adventists? Well, there are the folks that believe that you ought to still observe the Sabbath according to the Scripture. So the, the building becomes a testimony to the world around. But it started developing, I think, probably... Um, it really got kind of some steam under it about 25 years ago. And we found that around the nation, then churches began to sublimate Seventh-day Adventists to, in other words, reverse the order. They began putting a community church, a church of the Seventh-day Adventists, down below in smaller letters. And so the name was diminished. And this is what was being prophesied here in 1896, over a hundred years ago. And we just began seeing the fulfillment of that within the last 30 years. Now we have lots of, we have lots of community churches that are sponsored by or represented by the Seventh-day Adventist church, but it's the community church, a Seventh-day Adventist church. Prophecy is now fulfilling. Seventh-day Adventists have hauled down their colors in, the name, in naming their churches less prominently than a Seventh-day Adventist church. Many are now called some form of community church or identified with some other name. Diminished references there. There is to be no compromise with those who are worshiping an idle Sabbath. 
I was told that men will employ every policy to make less prominent the difference between the faith of Seventh-day Adventists and those who observe the first day of the week. In this controversy, the whole world will be engaged, and the time is short. This is no time to haul down our colors. There is, um, I almost hesitate to say this, but maybe I should anyway, and perhaps my hesitation means that I really should say it. There is a, um, there is a tendency in many places to make less prominent the Seventh-day Adventist identification. We should not do that. As the days go by, we need to make sure that we, we hold that up there for the world to see. Um, because as surely as we change that posture, we're going to be fulfilling this prophecy in a way we don't want to meet. And it'll be more clear, you know, a little bit later here as we see why this is the case. It starts with this, preaching a changed law. Men in responsible positions will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but from the sacred desk will urge upon the people the observance of the first day of the week, pleading tradition and custom in behalf of this man-made institution. You know, you could say, well, that's just under the influence of a larger Christian arena that culturally just accepts Sunday. Well, there is some, um, there is some evidence in the Scripture that this may come right from within our own ranks. And that would be of a most startling nature, wouldn't it? Daniel's prediction, Daniel 7, verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of times. We've referenced this time of um, movement against the law of God in centuries past. That effort that was evidence so prominently in the 1260 years of papal supremacy, that whole thing's going to be repeated again in a short, intense period of time. History will repeat itself. You're aware, of course, that um, a few generations ahead of us now, the younger people coming up, many of them don't have a clue about the Holocaust. They don't even know what it is. They don't really know about that horrible history in Europe just a short 60 years ago. That's why history is bound to re repeat itself. It forgets the price that people have paid who have gone before. We don't have to. We could read history and say, well, let's not make that mistake again. <laughs> But we don't seem to learn very well. Uh, as the new generation comes up, it has to learn all over again. Well, Satan charges God's law as faulty. The law which was spoken by God's own voice is faulty. That some specification has been set aside is the claim which Satan now puts forward. It is the last great deception that he will bring upon the world. This is what Satan does. He will do this through his agents... He will have his agents, some, in some cases, will be angels masquerading as human beings. And as, as society sees the good sense of putting certain laws into place to help correct the horrible things that we're seeing, they will put in place laws that they think will be serving the society well, but they will actually be against the law of Jehovah. And as that develops, and those who are faithful to the law of Jehovah, they say, well, I can't go there with you. I, you know, I can't do that. Then they become the stick in the mud. They become the resistance. 
And Satan comes along through his agents and says, Now look, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's this nice face that is there first. You must see that everybody's together on this. And uh, it'll be insinuated then that there have been some changes. You see, that's what will be the interesting thing. Coming from the side, coming from the professed side of the righteousness of God, there will be this, uh, sup, there will be this presentation that says, well, I know, you're saying that here's what the Bible says, but what you need to understand is that we have developed, we have moved, and there are now some changes that have been made. And ultimately, the sa Satan himself steps forth, masquerading as Jesus, and says, look, folks, you holdouts over here, you're not obeying my, my voice of bringing change to the human experience. What kind of position are those people going to be in? It's going to be a most unenviable position, but it will be a true position if, they, if they're standing faithfully on the Word of God. Satan doesn't need to change the whole law. He doesn't need to assail the whole law. If he can lead men to disregard one precept, his purpose is gained. What does the Bible say here in James 2.10? He who has, um, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. So by consenting to break one precept, men are brought under, the, under Satan's power. And by substituting human law for God's law, Satan will seek to control the world. This, this is a prophecy. As you're reading from the spirit of prophecy, this is a statement of what will happen. By substituting human law for God's law, Satan will seek to control the world. And here's where we begin to focus in where that comes to rest. The critics hate this. The critics of Adventism hate this. They make sport of this. They make fun of this because they do it, in fact, they do it kind of like this. You can't tell me. I mean, really, seriously, do you think that when we read in the Scripture that the law was nailed to the cross and you're coming now and saying that the observance of the fourth commandment is so important, you have made several blunders here. You have gone back to Judaism, for one thing. You've gone back to the Old Covenant. You're going back to this old idea of law-keeping. And they'll just list all of these things that make you look so silly for holding to the law of God and the Sabbath in particular. But the Sabbath has already been set aside by the world. And yet you can see that's why that continues to be an issue because if there are faithful ones, let's just say, if there are faithful ones in the world, as the biblical text says, here are they that keep the commandments of God, if there are such, then they have to reflect what the law of God says, don't they? Take yourselves out of the picture. Take, take all the Seventh-day Adventist churches out of the picture. There's got to be someone who reflects what the Bible says. And as soon as they reflect what the Bible says, someone's going to say, but I thought the law was nailed to the cross. In fact, I believe the law was nailed to the cross, so therefore, this can't be right. And the overwhelming cultural opinion is, and you are right. We don't have to keep the law anymore. When Jesus died on the cross, now we're all out from under that law-keeping. Well, that's how the devil has worked so ingeniously to make, make obedience to God's character, to his will, to make it an onerous thing, to make it something that's undesirable. 
But the Bible never presents it that way. We, we're we're going to look now, based upon what we covered last week in the text, we're going to make some comparisons here. And I think you'll see something rather striking. It's quite amazing. But you have to look for it to see it. And yet, with a little help like this, it's not hard to see. So you have the KJV on the left side, and you have the newer versions on the right there, a sampling of them, the NIV, the New International Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the American Standard Version. Exodus 20, verse 10. But, in the King James, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. We've highlighted those two words, the, of, the Sabbath of the Lord. The new versions, it's interesting, they all agree with each other. Remember what we said? The new versions all agree with each other against the KJV and the Spirit of Prophecy. So we didn't put the Spirit of Prophecy in here on the KJV side, but you could. You could put it right there. But look at those versions and, and notice how it reads. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. It's not the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It's a Sabbath to the Lord. And that may not be such a big distinction there. But that little word a completely changes the meaning. Leviticus 23, verse 3. Same setup comparison. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. A holy convocation, ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Look at the other side. Is a Sabbath... It is a Sabbath to the Lord. It's consistent. Definite or an indefinite article? This is the question. Whether you keep the Sabbath or a Sabbath will determine whether you receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And Ted writes here in his... Uh, unpublished manuscript, our eternal destiny hangs on what version of the Bible is going to guide us. I think it's interesting you put it that way. Um, now, of course, if you're quick to judge this statement, and some will be, they'll say, well, I didn't know that our, sa I didn't know that our salvation depended upon keeping the Sabbath. No, it doesn't. And the enemies, the, criti the critics of Adventism will have a heyday on this point unless you're reading it according to the texts and understand what is being said. You see, you're not saved by keeping the Sabbath. That's, we know that. That's, that's so obvious and clear in the Advent movement that you're not saved by law-keeping. Paul says, by no works of the law. Shall one be justified? Isn't that right? Works don't accomplish that. But is it true that only the obedient will be in heaven? I mean, if the rest of the disobedient, ugly, evil populace is going to heaven, how is that heaven? So if we're looking for that place of God, that, that restoration that God has promised, an earth made new where there was no per imperfection, that's the standard. It's always been the standard. The standard never changed. In fact, it was because of the standard, the righteous standard of God, that Jesus died on the cross. It was that broken relationship with the righteousness of God that demanded the death of the sinner. 
And why is it then that the, that the unrepentant sinner is destroyed in the last days? Because there's no sin in heaven. So what is the condition, what is, what is the basis upon which the government of heaven will operate? The righteousness of God. It'll ever be righteous. It, it has always been righteous, it is righteous, and it will be righteous. And the Lord, through His Word, first through the saving work of Jesus and through the grace ministered to us from the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is ministering for us, He makes possible for this transformation of us to come into the standard of the righteousness of God. So there's no way that we can think that we will be in heaven as disobedient people. It just won't be. That's something that we have to get hold of. The devil doesn't want us to see that. And if we see it, if we initially see it and say, well, yes, I, okay, I can see that that's true, then the next thing he hits you with is that you can never be that. That's the next thing he'll hit you with. That's the devil's work. God's work is always, well, I have... My son took your place, and my son now ministers his grace to you so you can be everything that I designed you to be. And you have no excuse. So get on board with that, and we'll just, we'll make it happen. That's what God's saying to us. We'll make it happen. He's saying, we'll make it happen. All heaven is going to make it happen for those that will submit themselves to it. So, it is true. Our eternal destiny hangs on what version of the Bible we're going to be guided by. Because God is not saying to us, I made a Sabbath back there in creation week. Actually, I made it on the seventh day of the week. But you can choose any one of them you want. We never read that in the Bible. Coming down the centuries of time, and he draws these people out of bondage, out of sinfulness, out of their weakness. He draws them out of Egypt, and he gets them out there in the, in the desert, and he starts to educate them, and he says, and furthermore, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you can work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of what? Of the Lord thy God. That's what he says. A couple of thousand years later, he's telling these people, remember what I did back there. Remember this Sabbath day. The seventh day Sabbath. There's no A in here. No A Sabbath. So the great test. And again I say, you'll hear this. And folks, you will hear this right within the household of Adventism. If you haven't heard it already, you will hear it if you live long enough and you stay with us. Now you might say, you know, Pastor, you're, you're making some statements here that are bothersome to me. Because you're talking about us as, you know, within the Advent movement, and you're saying things that, you know, make me wonder, you know, well, should we, are we, are we the people of God? And I will say to you, we have our problems, don't we? Are you afraid to say that? Do we have our problems? Sure we do. We've got a lot of problems. But the Lord has mapped out a course for us. And little by little, I'm absolutely convinced, little by little, He's getting us to see it. And He'll get us to understand it. And He'll get us to embrace it. And that's why I say, stay with us. Stay with the body of Christ. 
And he will do his work. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it under the day of Jesus Christ. Well, here the Lord tells us through the servant of the Lord. He says, the Lord has shown me. This is a, a, quite an important statement. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. So you see that even though that was written back in 1890, at this point in terms of how things have developed so far, we think that no one yet has received the mark of the beast. We see that as something that's before us. It's right here before us. These things will happen. Let me back up here a second. This is the test. Critics hate to see that. People that don't like the theology of the Advent movement. Uh, that's one of the points that they like to really pounce on. No, no, no. There's no test like that. Just, just believe Jesus is your Savior. You don't have any works to do. Well, the Lord does test His people. He tests His people. He will prove them to see what they're made of. He proved them in the Advent movement, in the very beginning of the Advent movement. You see that moving through that disappointment? The Lord didn't hold His people back from seeing falsehood there. He let them embrace some of these things that weren't quite... They, they had taken in much of their culture, just like we do today. And so their concepts of what the sanctuary was, was very much a cultural thing of the day. Most everyone in the Christian churches at large believed the earth was the sanctuary of God. So it only made sense that he was coming again to purge the earth. So they had some truth mixed with error. The Lord let them go ahead with that because it was a work in progress. He didn't just drop all the information of the Advent movement on them so they understood it clearly right from the very beginning. No, no, you go back and you read the history, the development of the Advent movement. It was a work in progress. And it was a tough go. They slogged it out night after night in Bible study. Much prayer anguishing with each other, with the Lord. Do they have it right? Wrestled with the prophecies. Got it wrong. Came out the other side. Well, for the early Advent believers, when Jesus didn't come, it was a test. God didn't deliver them from that test. He let them go through that test. And those who were shallow in their experience, who were not dedicated to going back and back and back to study the Word, washed out. There was just a tiny little handful of people that would continue to study. You know, it was that whole experience in the early part of the 19th century that kicked off this whole thing of preaching about the second coming of Jesus. And I have even heard it in the, Advent, in the Adventist church, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Let me put the whole name in there because we're, we're too prone to say Adventist church. Let's get over that. Help me get over that, would you? Amen. That we in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we begin to play down this idea of speaking about the second coming. God forbid that we should play down the idea of the second coming of Jesus. I've heard it within the Seventh-day Adventist church. When we start to talk about having a series of meetings, 
Somebody said to me one time, this was years ago, but I know the idea is still alive. They said to me, oh, pastor, I've heard that so many times. I'm just so tired of hearing that. My response? Well, you know it. You know the blessing of it. You should never get tired of proclaiming the second coming of Jesus because there's someone else that's coming new for the first time. You should be there. You should be there, a warm body in the pew next to them, encouraging them. How can you dare say, well, Pastor, I've heard that stuff so much. It's among us here. Sorry to say, it's among us here. It ought not to be. If Jesus is coming, if Jesus is coming, how can we take that position? If we take that position, oh, I've heard that so long, and there's somebody out there that we have influence on and we didn't get them here, how's that going to stand for us? When the Lord says, so how did it go with your little bailiwick, what you had responsibility for? And Jesus is asking me that question? I don't think I'm going to feel very good. That's not going to be very nice. But this is the test that the people of God will have before they're sealed. If there was a test for the beginning, the development, the springboard of the Advent movement, do you suppose that the test right before Jesus rings the hammer down on the sin problem, right before He brings down the curtain and a whole new paradigm opens up, do you suppose that just before that there would be any, any less test for the people of God? It's going to be a greater test. And we can thank the Lord if we live in the time when that's going to happen. We can only praise the Lord that we can have some small part in walking through that and saying, I'm a representative of Jesus Christ who believes in the second coming of Jesus, and I believe in this remnant concept. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm believing what the Bible says, that there will be those kind of people, and I want to be one of those. I might not do it very well right now, but I know the Lord will help me. I know He will transform me. I know He will give me everything that I need. And when it gets harder and harder and harder to stand for Him, I will find it easier and easier and easier because Jesus makes it possible for me. And they will rank under the banner of the Lord Jehovah. They will receive the seal of God. I've heard the critics on this point, receive the seal of the living God. Well, aren't we sealed at our baptism? Don't we get the seal of the Holy Spirit? Yes, you do. There's more than one kind of sealing. There is a sealing of the Holy Spirit that one testifies to and receives the ministry of the Holy Spirit through our confession of Jesus Christ and particularly through our baptismal experience. This is another kind of sealing. These are people sealed by the Holy Spirit that are going to walk through this experience in the end like no other experience, no other human experience on such a fantastic global scale. And it will be because they have read the Word and they see, they understand how it lays out that they should be faithful to God. And one of the best places, and I, this is the thing, God saw this eons before. He saw that the devil would have the entire Christian world hoodwinked on this one point of the commandments of God. And God says, that's the place where my people are going to be tested. That's where, they, that's where they will show their mettle. Because the world, not just the unbelieving world out there, 
But the Christian world, the professed people of God, will be arrayed against a little tiny remnant that says, no, we're forgetting something, folks. And this little remnant, as, they're, as they like to say, is the Mordecai in the gate. You know what I mean by that? Probably I should explain. Mordecai, there in Persia, in the time of Esther, was the one who would not bow to Haman because he would not bow to man. He only bowed to God. He was one of the faithful Hebrews. <laughs> he was a Mordecai. His name was Mordecai. He was given the privilege to sit in the gate. You know, if you sat in the gate, you were a respected person as one you could go to for questions about law, special decisions that had to be made. The king gave him that responsibility. But in doing that, he upset some people. And these people who will stay faithful to the Sabbath are the Mordecai, Mordecai in the gate. Well, creation account also changed in the modern visions. In the modern versions, pardon me. Modern versions. Satan has not only changed the law of God in the fourth commandment, but he's also changed the account of creation on which the fourth commandment is based Modern versions, such as the American Standard Version of 1901, the RSV, the NASB, the New World Translation, conclude each day of creation with the following words. And there was evening and there was morning one day. A second day, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, a sixth day. On the seventh day, God blessed the seventh day. A day. So we have here in the creation account an indefinite foundation for creation. Since the seventh day follows six indefinite periods of time, no one would actually know what day is the seventh day, thus making obedience to the fourth commandment an impossibility. The NIV marginal note says, first day. Some say that the creation days were 24-hour days, others that they were indefinite periods. This is what the Bible scholars say. The indefinite article A used to describe each of the six days of creation goes hand in hand with the use of the indefinite article A in the fourth commandment as found in the modern versions. The KJV steadfastly uses the definite article the, to describe each of the six days of creation and the Sabbath in the fourth commandment. The definite article, the indefinite article A and the indefinite periods of the NIV marginal note go together, go together like two peas in a pod. So here we have inspiration talking to us, the spirit of prophecy talking to us about the concept of indefinite time at creation. You know what the spirit of prophecy said about that. God himself measured off the first day, pardon me, the first week as a sample of successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, he con it consisted of seven literal days. Human philosophy declares that an indefinite period of time was taken in the creation of the world. Does God state the matter thus? No. He says, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days, in six days, not indefinite periods of time, because then there would be no way for a person to observe the day specified in the fourth commandment. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The sophistry in regard to the world's being created in an indefinite period of time is one of Satan's falsehoods. God speaks to the human family in language that they can comprehend. He does not leave the matter so indefinite that human beings can handle it according to their theories. 
Interesting that that was written way back here over a hundred years ago. And we're just talking about it tonight in terms of the new versions. By thus setting apart the Sabbath, God gave the world a memorial. He did not set apart one day and any day in seven, but one particular day, the seventh day. And by observing the Sabbath, we show that we recognize God as the living God, the creator of heaven and earth. He who instituted the Sabbath has never changed it to a common day. He rested on a definite day and blessed and sanctified a definite day. And he requires the human family to observe that definite day. Every part of God's plan will be perfectly executed. Satan has interfered and attempted to thwart it, but there is no change in the law of God. The position that God blessed and sanctified a seventh part of time and not a day in particular is one of Satan's devices. That was back in 1884 that that was written in the Advent, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. It's, uh, the name is here, the Review and Herald. So our summary thought, the modern versions agree with each other. We've already said this against the King James and the Spirit of Prophecy. It's telling to note that the 1901 American Standard Version, which is virtually the same as the 1885 English Revised Version, reads like most of the modern versions today on the crucial text dealing with creation and the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. And this is because most of the modern versions today are based upon the work of Westcott and Hort, the key individuals responsible for the English Revised Version, J.A. Hort, a professor at the University of Cambridge, and B.F. Westcott, Bishop of Durham, were higher critics who were drunk on the fornication of Babylon, the wine of Babylon. And that's why those, that's why those texts reflect it the way they do. Um, I'm going to, um, it's 8.30 now, and I'm going to stop with this, I think. I want to give you this one, and we'll pick it up here tomorrow morning. But I want you to see this before you go. Westcott, one of these Greek um, translators, uh, Westcott and Hort, the two go together, on which the, uh, much of the new versions are based. He wrote to the Archbishop of Canterbury, no one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. Yet they disclose to us a gospel. It's interesting that even when he refers to the gospel, it's a, a gospel. It's kind of, well, a gospel. Shall I give you just one more? How about Hort? on Eden and the fall. So these two guys, this gives you a little bit of an idea of where they're coming from theologically as they're writing the Greek text on which all of these new versions get, get uh, produced. Fenton Hort, the leading man in the English Revised Project, wrote this to John Ellerton. I am inclined to think that no such state as Eden, I mean the popular notion, ever existed and that Adam's fall in no degree differed from the fall from each of his descendants. Well, that's an interesting thought. So we'll stop there, and uh, we'll pick it up right around here tomorrow morning. But I think you're beginning to see, you know, after, especially after last weekend, and uh, now with this, this comparison of the Law of God texts, and it's just a few of them, and the creation texts, just that part of the Scripture, the difference between the definite position that the King James has in the, in the language and the indefinite nebulousness from the New Versions to the KJV. Um, once again, I'm not suggesting that you throw out all of your modern versions. 
uh, if you really want to know things, you have to keep those around. You have to keep them in your library. You have to know things, and that helps you know things. But it helps you be a person of knowledge when it comes to the use of your Bible, the one that you choose, that you think, you understand, and you believe gives you the best opportunity to have the most reliable understanding of the character of God as it was passed down to us through the centuries. Does that make sense? I hope that it's making some sense because it's the truth. And so we'll pick it up, we'll pick up this, uh, this line of thought and you'll be interested to see where we go with some of this as we move ahead. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the testimony and the witness of the scripture and the spirit of prophecy. And we see how these two go hand in hand here in the very end of time when we are confronted with so many what appear to be wonderful and lovely things when it comes to the production of your word. And yet we can see the hand of Satan working in these things. And we want, Lord, to have understanding. We want to be faithful to your word. And we know that as we come to the close of time, it's going to be even more important for us to know that we can depend upon your word. So God, we pray, guide us in our study and uh, bring us together tomorrow for another time to worship together, to reflect upon your goodness. We thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for this wonderful gift that brings rest to us, provides us an opportunity to think of your goodness, of your mercy, and the wonderful work of Jesus to save our souls. So, Lord, go with us now as we go home. Bless this time we share together as families. Keep us in your care, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.